All right. Um, we're going to get started. This is the first of our lunchtime conversations for this year of Great Plains Theater Conference. Um, I'm Ron Zank. I'm an assistant professor at Culver Stockton College. Uh, this panel is Found Spaces and Beyond. We're going to be discussing immersive theater. If the rest of my panelists would introduce themselves, please. Oh. Uh, Thomas Riccio from the University of Texas at Dallas. Justin Townsend, uh, assistant professor at Brooklyn College. I'm Jack Frederick. I'm with the Same Fortune Collective in New York. I'm uh, John Johnny Gasper, also with Saint Fortune Collective. And I'm Danny Carroll, also with Saint Fortune. <coughs> All right. Um, so just to get started, um, I think a lot of us are aware of the notion of theater in found spaces. That is, theater in existing spaces, and sort of the sort of <coughs> resonance that that has. And we've sort of moved beyond that a little bit with immersive theater. Tom, would you like to talk a little bit about how you maybe see immersive theater being a little bit different than what people may have been thinking of in the past? Woo. Okay, um, my uh, approach to immersive theater comes uh, from my work with indigenous people. So they, in a sense, they've been doing immersive theater for thousands of years. Uh, the immersiveness is um, the fact that it is very site specific, it's ritual specific, it's when they perform, they perform the animals, the spirits, um, uh, the elements that are around them and they bring them into the conversation. And it's in a marked difference from the Western perspective which basically is a social uh, remediation uh, use of performance and drama where theirs is a remediation uh, and, and a celebration of a totality. So in a sense, they, when they perform, it's an immersiveness. So I've brought that idea into, um, I'm too, too hot? Are you waving at me? Oh, okay. Hey, Alistair. <laughs> I see someone waving. Hey. Too hot. <laughs> um, and so I bring that to my work. I have a theater company, a performance uh, company uh, called Dead White Zombies in, in uh, Dallas. Uh, and I bring uh, ritual and um, immersive elements uh, to what we do, which, um, I don't know, is that a good start? That's I a mean, good start. Yeah, that's a good start. Justin, would you like to talk a little bit about the projects that you've worked on that might be considered more immersive than, say, just traditional theater? We were, we were talking about this earlier on the, on the panel just, just, just now, and this, this idea uh, uh, Elena and I were speaking about if, of, of playwrights essentially through language are creating an immersive environment, right? And so, so to say, you know, what is this, this, this new idea is a bit complicated uh, and, and perhaps I, I worry about it, but, 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 but to say, let's say, okay, so maybe visually immersive, but again, we've been building playhouses for a long time, but somehow this idea of decorating or making something that, that one might tunnel through, the audience might travel through the experience, or perhaps that the theater itself is, is handled in a different, in a different way, um, uh, aesthetically or, um, uh, or, or how, we, how the audience even interacts with the space. So, so in that sense, the, 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 there's actually a sort of fuzzy line as to say, you know, when are we doing work that is strictly, uh, uh, I'm going to sit in the audience and, and you are going to sit on the other side of the proscenium and, and make something and I'll perceive it with a sort of uh, unacknowledgement of the space between us. And when are we starting to actually acknowledge the architecture and space and, and uh, worlds uh, as a part of the event? And, and, and I, I would be, it, would be, it could be a long list for us to start to say, well, this slides on, uh, you know, here it is on the spectrum of, the, of those spaces, that, that, that perhaps it's that, uh, um, uh, that it is the space between us that for me is, is what's exciting as a, as a, as a visual artist uh, making performance work. All right. Um, I'll just t speak to St. Fortune collectively. Um, you can answer as you will, um, because now you're going to interrupt each other anyway. So well, we were joking um, that we're all going to answer at the same time. So, yeah. <laughs> so like be the ready. Pre um, so just a little bit about um, your immersive work and, and how you see it and what you've experienced, both as creators and even as audience, because I think that's important too. All right. Uh, well, one of the first uh, things that we did was uh, Jack did this play called Unloaded for Bear. Uh, it was about. Um, a safari expedition in Africa, and um, we ended and uh, he staged it in our backyard at school. So it was so that the uh, the audience like walked through like a forest in a way to arrive at the stage, which was just a tent and like a campfire. Yeah, and it just something about the season at that time. It actually kind of looked like the African savanna, and so we were. But that was a really uh, you know 
saying like a having like a proscenium arch in in nature going on, you know. Um, and, so and we its own lighting effects too, like with the sun setting. Right. I mean, was something that you really can't duplicate in a building. So, right. There were, um, I think, some of the most immersive qualities of that performance. Uh, two of the characters, um, as the audience started to walk through a field, enter into the forest, uh, they arrived as guides. Um, so they met the audience to then bring them to forward to the rest of the camp. And then uh, as you know, the sun set, um, there were effects that we used uh, with um, cars, headlights far off uh, in the distance, um, using the extent of the space around us um, to create a sense of foreboding, I think, at that moment. Yeah, it, when, you, when you get out of a theater, a, a lot of opportunities open up for you as far as what you can use. You can use real fire, you can use full automobiles, you can, you can use anything. And, 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 you know, there's some drawbacks to using an outdoor space. We had some kids who were walking their dog and there were some, they were real punks and they like disrupted like a whole <laughs> performance because um, they were just like, there's people out here doing a play, let's mess with them. So, um, so but, then that, to, but then that becomes part of the play. Right, you know, people so. were like, how'd you get all those crazy noises out there in the <laughs> field? And I was like, yeah, yeah we planned that, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> and then, um, but, but now we found that we're moving towards more of a, um, dealing with the audience and getting rid of the, uh, the space between the audience and the actors. So we're working on this um, on wood music on Friday night, which you should all attend because it's going to be fantastic. Um, but I can't tell you anything about it because it's a secret. <laughs> How very informative. Uh, <laughs> Tom and Danny, well, anybody, if, if you want to talk, since we are at a playwriting conference, um, maybe about some of the challenges or some of the differences in terms of working, writing in a more immersive form as opposed to maybe a more traditional script, what you find, what opportunities, what presents? Um, well, I, I think one of the main things about using found space and immersive theater is, is looking at the space you have and, and deciding what you can do there that you can't do anywhere else. Um, and writing the story uh, in the vein of that inspiration. Um, I did a piece that I wrote for uh, Gavin Price, who is usually at the conference, usually a fixture, but is unfortunately not here this year, um, on the High Line in New York City. Uh, and for those of you who know the High Line, there is a section that uh, has these windows that overlook 10th Avenue. Um, and so we not only set it um, in, a, uh, in a situation uh, in an apartment where you'd be looking over 10th Avenue, um, but also use the fact that we had, you know, sort of an endless uh, fly space um, to do some effects with balloons in front of those windows and people actually down on the street a couple of blocks away from where the action was happening, um, filling that backdrop in a way that you could never fill a backdrop uh, in a traditional theater. Um, and, and you pique an audience's curiosity when suddenly they realize that these things going on you know, in a busy city far down from where, they're, from where their perspective is is actually part of the drama. Um, it's titillating, and, and I wanted to, to use that. Um, and so I... I, I I think it is it is challenging, but it is sometimes um, even more freeing uh, to to write for something that is um, unique in that way. Uh, uh, as far as writing, I'll, maybe I'll talk about TNB, which is a, a, a performance we did last year this time, and it took place in a former crack house, and uh, the previous owner had just vacated the space uh, a few weeks before we moved in. And the man I developed, I, I, actually, uh, the play had its first reading here at uh, the Great Plains uh, several years ago. I think it was in 2011. And from there, I, I uh, enlisted uh, the assistance of a, a friend of mine who is a convicted felon and also a gangbanger. And what we did is uh, we worked together and we developed a piece on paper and then we put, put into the house. A local developer uh, was gracious enough to give us the house for a dollar. And um, what we did was we shaped, we shaped the performance to uh, the house itself. Um, it had several rooms which we could only bring in like 25, 30 people, which was fine. And, yeah, and the whole notion is that this man, this African-American man, is coming home uh, from a botched uh, robbery attempt. And in the house, there is his brother. Uh, he didn't know this, his twin brother, who was a white man. And so the issue then becomes, are you, are you being black? Are you performing black? a gangbanger? Is it an act you're putting on because you don't know any other uh, options? Uh, and then there was issues, like technical issues, like if I'm in the living room 
and there's action happening in the kitchen, it's like not everyone can be in the kitchen. It's just too small of a house. So what we did is we, we uh, devised the idea of uh, um, uh, creating closed circuit TV cameras in each room. So you can be in any room, like, like in the botched uh, robbery attempt, and like a 7-Eleven, the liquor store, uh, where he, uh, uh, the, the, the attempt took place, you can watch anywhere you like um, you know, the events in the other, other room. So we use that kind of like coherent to the piece, but also uh, as a practical solution. And the fact that you're in a house which was decorated as his mother would have left. Uh, his, now we find out she's deceased, but she's co cooking in the kitchen. You can smell collard greens. Uh, in fact, she would serve collard greens to uh, anyone who asked. Um, and washing dishes, dishes et cetera. So very live action. Um, and, so, and you're sitting in a living room, and it feels like you're at home, like you would if you know, your, your parents in the other room or uh, someone else, and you just hear the conversation. And so it has this home-like quality uh, which basically <coughs> offset the very aggressive uh, style of the piece in this man's life. We, we, and then upstairs, he comes to find out there's Storm Crow, who represents 500 years of African-American maleness, who came, comes downstairs to rectify his shit. And so basically, he calls him on it. Uh, and so this, uh, and essentially, it's on, unraveling of his life. And then he, doesn't, he realizes at the very end that, uh, um, that he's died. He, he was killed in that botched attempt. And he came home, basically. Um, and I mentioned earlier about how I use ritual. Essentially, the diagram was not a dramaturgical diagram of the West, uh, beginning, middle, end. It's much, uh, much more uh, emotive and much more based on, uh, very consciously, of uh, ritual healing. Uh, shamanic healing. So he comes in and his, the white brother, his twin brother, is basically his helping spirit. And he has to reconcile all of the things in his life before he can move on. So once he discovers this in the, in the dining room, and served up in the dining room is not food, but are bullets uh, at the dining room table. And so once he finds out um, that he's, he actually had been killed, he leaves out into the, uh, on, into the street uh, and where his mother, playing a tambourine, a very good uh, actress who could sing gospel, uh, the, uh, a woman representing many of the uh, women in his life that he abused and he loved, and his whole, uh, the whole really quite bundled uh, um, difficulties he's had with women in his life, uh, Storm Crow, and then his brother. They're all waiting there. And it is a chalk line of his body on the, on the, the concrete. And so the entire audience goes in the street, and at the end, uh, Storm Crow, who's a 350-pound uh, spoken word artist, first time acting, uh, calls him and says, let's go, man. And it, it, it ends with him walking down the street and, and pulling this young man named Spooky, the character is named Spooky, because he is a ghost, uh, down the street. And then the audience leaves. And so the writing for us is, uh, I hate acting. I'll put that out there. Uh, I, I despise it. I, I like, and I think part of this whole immersion consideration which is evolving is a reconsideration of what acting is and what acting should do. Um, I, I, what I try to do is to make it very real. When you're that close and you're right next to someone, to act is, is very, unless you want to artificially uh, create that sensibility, it's, it's very false. And we want a reality now because there's so much artificiality in our life. And these are, this may be a, something for a larger discussion, but we have to ask ourselves why immersion and why now? Um, why in our world? Why, if immersion is a manifestation of a necessity, as all art is, and a, a marking of our time, what is that saying about our time? We want to be involved. We want to be immersed. Because you look at our world, uh, and we're immersed, and we're realizing we haven't been immersed. And because of that, our, our, our global eco ecological uh, systems are, are failing. Uh, and, and you look at the structure of the traditional proscenium march, which has been talked about here, it's basically uh, the illuminated mind speaking to the passive body. We can no longer be passive bodies. That era is past, and yet we're still kind of like uh, caught up in the dramaturgy and in the bureaucracies of, in theaters, so people being employed in such a way that they don't want to give it up, uh, or they can't because, hey, I, I'm, I do this for a living. This is how we, we structure our, our performance. This is, we have a black box or proscenium. We spend all this money on it, so we have to make sh sure it works. It doesn't work, just like our systems around us, uh, capitalism, for instance, another, another uh, symposium here, uh, but it's all interrelated. And it's immersive. It's all interrelated, and we have to consider all these things. So in a sense, it's not just about the architecture of putting something in a space. It's about a whole other way of, of, of creating a narrative, and it's the artist who must lead and create new narratives. It's our, and this is only part of a, a composited 
a larger picture and a larger puzzle piece uh, that we have to put together. And that's, that's the charge. So we're in a very interesting place, you know, historically. And, and I, I, for me, we have to jump in very knowingly. Because I, I think, or, or I worry that, it, in the best light, that's the version, that it's a, it's a, it's a civic, it's a proactive, it's a, um, uh, an engaged society that comes to immersive work. I worry, on the other side of it, that it's, it's no more than our internet experience. I'm a single point of camera traveling in the world where I may or may not pick up an experience. Right, that we that we, we've we've uh, uh, I, I didn't see the, this performance, but but other performances, immersive work can, can be on its bad day. I get lost staring at the structure of the closet because I'm interested in the architecture of that, but never in fact engage in the engage in the story, which I I wonder about as we as we create these things, how we continue to adjust them because I I, I think that immersiveness is a, is an extension of. Of, uh, uh, is a continued pursuit of, of naturalism or realism, uh, let's say realism, on stage. That, that it's the next step beyond that. Well, well, and maybe that's your perception of it. For me, again, going, going back to indigeneity uh, in the indigenous world, which is my model, we th tend to think that story is only told by humans, that story is only told mm. through text. Uh, stories told by a multiple, this room it has stories in it. Uh, if you're doing site-specific, what's the story, what's the character of the room saying? What are the histories there that need to be unbundled? Uh, what, what do animals, how many times on stage do we consider animals or spirits in a way that is, is of equal grounding, uh, uh, in a sensorial way? We don't. We look at them basically in this old kind of like, you know, Western uh, perception, human-centric perception. We can't look at the world like that anymore. It's, uh -huh. uh, you know, so this is, so in my, in my immersive work, I try to, basically, it's an exploration. I don't know. I have no idea if it will work or not, but I'm trying it, and what's happening is audiences are responding, because whether conscious or unconscious, we're sensitized that we have to kind of change, that things are happening, and we need to fundamentally rethink, you know, how we do things, and, and not just propagate older ways of being in the world, older forms. Uh, but you're right, there, there's, there, there are issues that, you know, this is a, a, an important discussion that's, you know, very long, much longer than a few tidbits we can give here. <laughs> Justin, what about turning back to that design question in terms of, I mean, because it's a very different thing to craft a design for something that's more immersive as opposed to, you know, okay, the audience is going to be in a proscenium space and they're going to sit here for X amount of time. Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, right, like, again, the, the idea that we're sitting up here and we have, you know, you all are sort of scooted onto a small table, right, in, 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 in a series of other tables. So, so I, I propose that we actually never lose track of where we are. This idea that we can go, we can, uh, in the olden days, we might turn out the lights and really, when the lights come on, we're in your subconscious. Right? It's just one I don't feel connected to, right? I just, I'm like, no, I'm still sort of in these com uncomfortable chairs, I'll packed in all these people. I wanted that seat over there, but okay, this will be pretty good. I'll take this. Um, you know, th th that's part of the experience of, of, my, of my playmaking and play watching and engaging with the thing. So, 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 you know, okay, now we can extend design so that, well, should, should, should it just be framework, right? And, and we saw our, 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 um, our, our friends of generations and, 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 and uh, ago where we said American theater needs to, what we really need is to be in the thrust. That will save the world. <laughs> because everyone will get closer to the performance. It'll feel realer if we're in the thrust or the round, right? And, and, and across the country, we can go and celebrate those theaters that are still there. Um, uh, and now we're in this big idea of, we are going to make a black box that could be anything you ever wanted. And it turns out that's frightfully expensive to adjust every single time to make uh, whatever we want to make. So, so, so I think there is a process where we can engage or open our hearts to say, what would be the most exciting way to perceive this story, to engage with this story? But I, but I, I do wonder, um, uh, these, these, uh, these empty boxes, these frames of space that we have, uh, uh, are we always... Um, Investing our stories, or, or, or having a relationship with a story, uh, in in these in in these civic structures that have uh, certain uh, histories to them, uh, uh, yeah. There. No, I think that's great. Well, and I think it kind of responds to something that Tom was talking about. There was an article I was looking at that talked about site-specific theater in terms of productions being placed within a particular space. But they said that's really some of the most powerful, or I think more of what Tom was re referring to, which is um, site-responsive theater, where you're really taking into account the space that you're in, the history of that space, whether it's its use or its, you know, architectural placement, something like that. So I think those possibilities are really great. And actually, guys, I think with your piece coming up 
on Friday, I think you're doing some of that. Can you speak to that abstractly since you don't want oh, to uh, yeah, give us oh, definitely, any details? Yeah. No, um, basically everything that, that w is, is being built and has been built and will be seen on Friday is, uh, come, is about activating uh, some part of the history of this mill that we've learned about. And um, whether that be through things that they have in the mill, a prop, uh, a song that we would uh, supply, um, anything. There's a lot of different ways you can tell that history. So we were really interested in all those different ways and exploring with that. Um, Site responsive, I think, is a really good um, term for, for what we're doing here because, again, uh, it is a place with a great deal of history. Um, and so uh, going into this as outsiders, of course, we have to be um, examining that history very explicitly and making sure that that is a um, a loud voice in how we interpret and use the space. And it, it, essentially, like uh, Tom said, like making the space a character, it's like the mill is the main character of this play. I mean, there are like actors. I know you don't, you don't like actors, but <laughs> there, there are actors who are walking around in it and they are interacting with it as if it were an actual like breathing thing, which I mean, maybe it, maybe it is. Maybe like you can hear it sometimes, like speaking to you, you know, and like establishing a dialogue with that. I mean, I mean, I'm, I just got here, so I'm like really eager to get up there and like work it. And uh, but but before we before we came down, we, we wrote this like whole like script of like what we wanted to do in the in the theater or in the, the theater. Look, I'm even talking about it like it's a theater, but it's it's not a theater. Uh, but so so like trying to reconcile those words that we wrote with what the mill is actually saying to us. Like we need to listen to it, and we can't just be like, oh, we're just gonna force these things onto you, and we're gonna like pack all these people into this little space because that's what we were going to do. Yeah, exactly. We we built we've rewritten this show countless times at this how many, point. How many times? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. And like basically um, we were working off a of video, which was the thing is that you should really ideally build a site specific piece off the site of <laughs> having been there, but we didn't ha we were working off a of video that Kevin sent us. And so the like the technical problems of a video is for some reason the perspective might be off when you're standing in a different area. So it was very funny cuz we built this whole thing on what we thought the mill was going to be and then we got into the space and it's been an incredible experience like recon reconciling something that was completely in our subconscious now with like well what would this actually be the night of the show uh, to go off of um some of what tom and justin were talking about uh, in regards to um site responsive these concepts i think you can also be site responsive in rebellion to a space um when we're asking about like why immersive now why are we calling for it um i just remember you know very early in our in our company uh you know we had a black box that we always used in our undergraduate and um our one of our last performances we really made an attempt to change how everyone was uh, approaching the space. You know, everyone for every show would enter through the same double doors. And for this show, we had them go through this back corridor that we lit this way because we wanted to make that space a bunker. And, and that was just immediate and instinctive because it was a rebellion against what was constant in that space. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that, that is why immersive now um, is, is a good question because I, I feel as though theater um, in contrast to all of the other media uh, story, especially uh, story delivering media, um, we, we want to know now how theater can function for a population so affected by that. Um, and I think visceral, visceral is, is really what it's all about. When maybe, you boil it's, it down. maybe it's the internet ruining everything. Like we're <laughs> like kind of just living in these, these digital spheres so we just like crave like actually seeing somebody up close. Whereas like back in the day, I mean, I, I lived back like in the 70s, you know, and I didn't actually. But like <laughs> from like, like theaters, you, that's why you like sit there and you like, you would see real people at a distance and the, that was real, you know, but now since like we have TV and film and it's like immediate in that way, maybe that's why we're turning to immersive now is it, because it's like, you're so close that you can touch them and you can touch them even though they are performing and they're doing something that you can't experience on a daily basis. Just I think, too, is an issue of the relationship with the audience. I, I found that our audiences have become 
uh, characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In fact, in our next, next uh, performance, we're deliberately moving more towards that. Uh, and also, our, our audiences in, in the main are very few traditional theater people in Dallas, mm -hmm. which has a very thriving theater scene. I'd say only maybe 20, 25 percent of our audiences are, are traditional theater people, and the majority are people who basically have given up on theater. Mm -hmm. Visual artists, uh, uh, people who essentially saying that theater doesn't really respond to the world. It's kind of old-fashioned and, and stodgy, and it's like uh, it's dated. These are things I hear, and our audiences tend to be young, uh, whereas most audiences and most theaters, uh, you know, tend to be you know middle-aged to to older. Uh, we get young audiences, and they're very hungry for it, and they like the fact. Not that they go into perform, it's just that they realize, and I'm, I'm thinking of one antidote, this is a, a man um, uh, who's a, a partner of a major uh, law firm in Dallas. He and his wife came, and we, have a, we had another performance we did, it was a 36,000 square foot uh, former welding shop. Um, and it dealt with uh, the journey of two uh, souls after the fall of Troy throughout multiple lifetimes. And so uh, we uh, limit to like 50 uh, people in an audience. And essentially, it can go from an hour and a half to four hours. It's durational uh, and loop depending on um, the interest of the audiences. And so you can never see the entire thing in one night. I mean, every night you go, it's something different. In fact, as a director, Sarah, sometimes I would go to one space, <coughs> and not having been there, and realizing that they, they, they evolve something. Uh, so, and they are, uh, they have room as, as performers to, and I use performer rather than actors, because <laughs> um, that's what I, you know, a broader sp a span of like uh, a spectrum. But they're, they're, they're encouraged and we evolve it in a way that they're, that, um, that's, it's part of what we do, that they're encouraged to evolve it. But this lawyer was with his wife, guy in his late 60s, and he, and he realized that, he says, I was watching others watching me as well as watching the scene. Uh, and in a sense, that's a holism which I really aspire to, that we're all part of this, that there's no exclusion, uh, that we're all part of, of a condition now. And we are disenfranchised, and, and our, our media and the Internet is manipulating us uh, in a way. And, and more and more, if you just look at the business uh, uh, page of any uh, newspaper, uh, more and more large corporations are gobbling up smaller uh, corporations which basically want to control the story. So it's like, where do you go for real story? Where do you can go to even have like a free internet that's not, you know, uh, things popping up from a search from two years ago? Uh, where do you go? I mean, so in a sense, uh, it's a grassroots kind of activist approach is how we, we perceive it. And people, are, I think, are, are sensing that that is an alternative. To, and it's a way of you know, reimagining and invigorating the imagination and creativity uh, for our, our community. Right, you're encouraging people to actively participate in it rather than be passive, you know. And, like and to be well, aware of who they are. Right. In, in the TNB show, it was interesting that we, we allow video, all of our shows. Mm -hmm. So you want to take video, fine. If you want to walk out, go to the bathroom, come back, people go out, have a cigarette, and go back in. It's like, it's, it's kind of relaxed. Mm -hmm. And it's based on things I've seen. Uh, one inspiration was this event in Burkina Faso, where there's major, like, a ritual, but there are events over there, over there, over there, and it's like, it's like I didn't know where to go, but I went to where I needed to go. Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed to see. So chance is how the spirits speak. That's how the, the perception. So if I go there, if I go looking at the door, that's what I need to see. I need to see that door. Who, that's my story. That's what I need to see right now. So it's, it's kind of breaking our concept of like how we function and what we present you know, as artists, you know, what our vocabulary is, what our uh, responsibilities are. Yeah, and I think as a, as a theater maker, what is most exciting about immersive theater is it's a, a type of thing that you can only do with theater. As a, I mean, it's easy enough to, get a, to, to shoot a movie on your iPhone. Like, why, why does the story have to be told this in a theater? Well, it, it only seems to follow that why, you, why not use the medium in a way that, only, that you can only use it for? Questions? Do we have a microphone around or no? We do. <coughs> One sec. <laughs> vamp, 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 vamp. Thanks. Working on this piece, the, this mill piece with you, and um, what's what's your name? And with all respect for immersion theater, because I, I do love it, attending it and doing it. But when is it just a gimmick? When is it um, an actual response to the fact that we can no longer sit in a theater and just listen 
and having that be an immersive experience and that creating a full world for us, how is it that we've become such a visual society and the need for physical stimulation and visual stimulation all around us that we are forming our theater in response to that? I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all, but when um, have our attention, is, is immersion theater a response to the fact that our attention spans are too short? Well, I do think gimmick does have a bit of negative connotation. So, but 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 to, to, to take that away, uh, I wonder. Maybe hook, <laughs> hook. Yeah, is there something about uh, maybe maybe part of for me the experience is to break it away from uh, uh, to to make it event versus story. Um, that, that that somehow for for me the um, uh, to to see an immersive event is to see the event of the thing, that many things can happen, that I can get lost staring at the door and maybe miss the fact that, oh, this is all based on Macbeth. I didn't realize that um, because there were so many people walking around in white masks. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the there becomes a different experience. I do wonder, though, how it be, continues to be specific, that, that, it's, that, 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 we're, that, the, that the event continues to be unique and, 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 and link us to a, um, uh, I'm a theater artist because I'm interested in story. So how does story layer itself back into that? I, 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 I'm not answering anything. I, I want to further that question actually uh, that Elena had to go off of the example you just used. Uh, you were mentioning Sleep No More, um, I think there, which is the, probably the most famous immersive theater in New York right now. It's um, based on Macbeth, but it, came up early in our talks about the mill and I think very quickly we decided we didn't want to maybe use um, sleep no more tactics um, is is I have I've never actually seen sleep no more um, but I am wondering you know how much of that is composed of things that are gimmick and how much of that speaks to what you were talking about before about uh, the individual like they travel through the internet um, having such a subjective experience that it is detrimental um, because they can take their, you know, they can um, walk their way through and, and perhaps only skim the surface because they're not not an immersive theater person. I'm not sure, but uh, Sleep No More is an example, I think. Well, I think Justin, like, mentioned, like, story versus event is, like, the perfect way to phrase it because, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen Sleep No More, and it was, yeah, it was, like, there wasn't much story. It was more just, like, you made your own story in a sense. Like, that's maybe just, like, what Tom was saying, if you find yourself stuck in a closet with somebody who's, like, cracking eggs in your hand, yeah, like, but, what does that say about... But, but, but we did, but both the, both the examples on the table, uh, were, Tom, you really talked about a story. I mean, there's a real clear mm -hmm. beginning, mm -hmm. middle, and end, and... and I, I think it's conceptions of, st of what can tell a story. Again, we're, we're very... Uh, alphabet culture minded, which is a, a part of what civilization is and part of how we got where we are right now. Uh, but you know, it doesn't mean we always stay there. So maybe I don't see a visualization uh, as a, a, a negative. It's maybe we're at the onset of something, a, a kind of a new consciousness. Um, I see, so I, everything is a text in a sense. I see the whole world is like a forest of symbols. So when I see a tree, it's like that thing is seen so much as an elder. It's saying things. It's just that we're not hearing them. We're, we, because someone has to uh, write a poem about it or make an a, a alphabet uh, 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 documentation of it, then we hear it and then we see it. It's been speaking. Uh, having worked in, in Asia a bit, the, uh, it was very interesting. And as a designer, maybe you appreciate this. We had a production meeting in Korea. And the designer was coming in. And so he just held up some paper. And he did like this dance. You know, with this paper, this beautiful, like, you know, a hand printed paper. And everyone just sat there. And they like, and we were all feeling that it was the right paper. <laughs> you know, and like we think, you know, and, and I've worked in Alaska, Alaska Native people. Oftentimes I had to caution my non native students who might be working with us that, and, you know, I'm a fast speaker. I, I love life. I want to share what I have. But Alaska Native people and many indigenous people, they, when you say something, you have to give them time for them to respond. So there are sometimes there were students, there were performers who would, they would leave the room and I go, is everything okay? And I go, yes, there's just so much feeling that I had to leave the room. And so it, it becomes very, uh, almost meditative, the communication. So it's a very different way of looking at it. We're kind of thinking that it has to be words to communicate and that means we're alive and thinking. 
I don't, I don't feel that's a necessity. They are one component equal, is the way I see it. With sound, with movement, sensorial interaction, with emotion, they're all equals. And as a, as a director, as a creator, as a performer, you have all these things to work with. Uh, so that's, that's how I've, I'm approaching it. So again, it's a reconfiguration, a reformulation formalization of, of like, and a re kind of con uh, uh, I, I way of like conceiving performance and how it functions is where I'm at with it. And, and as uh, the more, it, all, it has a lot to do with the type of story you're trying to tell because as we learn more and more about the mill, the, the reason that we s structured the initial project the way that we did was because it was learning about the mill, it has an incredibly rich history, but it's not a history that is particularly interesting if you tell it start to finish, I think. I think that there's really fleshed out sections of the mill's history that are worth looking at. And so how do you tell that story that's so episodic but doesn't really have an arc necessarily? It's been so interesting listening to you guys talk. I was wondering, you know, I'm struck that the uh, title of this panel is Found Space, you know, and uh, versus Site-Specific Space. And uh, I'm interested in hearing if any of you have made work where instead of being inspired by a single space or creating work that, um, uh, it, you know, is, is site-specific, that you've created a work that either has wandering, which is kind of a uh, there's a lot of theoretical um, interest now in wandering a sort of revolutionary construct or structure, right? And uh, or um, that you're interested in found audience, um, which would have you know that a moving, you know, because we're in a in a, uh, a medium of time and space, right? So uh, I don't know. Are are you thinking about space? I don't know beyond just being in a non-theatricalized environment. Yeah, uh, I was part of this um, uh, project with the Institute for Psychogeographic Adventure, is their name, uh, last year, um, that my role in it was essentially to sit on a roof and give people tarot card readings. Um, and the audience like chose to go on, like a, they didn't know like where they were going, but they knew they were going on a journey. And so like each new location <coughs> was like a a new a new story in a way and like you mentioned like non-audience like they would be on the street like people would be walking down the street and watching it like watching this ballerina dance down the street and then an astronaut like come over and like pick her up and things so they became i guess unwilling audience members in in, in a sense and then i and then also there was like a pretty violent like altercation on one path and somebody intervened and like stopped it and was like, this is wrong. You, like, stop, stop hurting this person. Like, s leave her alone. And we were, and the, everybody was like, uh, can we go on with the play now? And, but, but that, like, that was the, that. But like I said, that like became the play. You know that this, Such drama. yeah, this person like interacting, uh, like an unwilling performer in in a sense. You know, like they, they, they became part of the play. In years past here at the conference, actually, I think um, some of what we've done with the Fringe Festival. That, that will be happening again this year um, has has involved uh, maybe delivering a reluctant audience, if you will, into our hands. <laughs> um, you know, one of the first the first things we did for the first Fringe Festival, we uh, we built this just frame story around the entire Fringe Festival, just uh, involving birthday clowns, because at the time we had all been making our money by doing some birthday clowning, and and so uh, we had just gotten so much from that that um, we created this piece that wasn't necessarily a, a play in and of itself, but was a, a, a guiding force through the rest of the festival, um, and we just called it, uh, what was it, Don't, Don't Feed the Balloon Animals, yeah. or something like that. Um, and that, it, it again, it was, uh, just having these these characters that were not in relation necessarily to um, the themes or the stories of any of the other shows in the uh, uh, in the Fringe Festival, um, but were instead this rogue force that was going to bring things onto you at some point, whether it be uh, you know a, a, an interview, you were going to get a balloon animal, you were going to get you know a, a birthday cake. Spider Man, Spider -Man, Spider -Man came, man. He was at the party. Uh, <laughs> it yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know your if you guys qu your question was about found audiences. Is that? Sure. Yeah. Is that is that it? 
In a way, I mean, is this a, a site-specific specific performance right now, what we're experiencing? I mean, and what would make it, quote unquote, uh, a bracketed performance? What do you need to make this a performance? Um, this event right here, right? Programs. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm saying, so in a way, bring it all the way down to, you know, boil it, you know, to uh, its essence. What really makes performance and what is it, it function? Um, I mean, in an activating, I mean, what would activate this as a performance? I, I was recently in Turkey and at an artist residency, and the area I was in was really nice, except that it was a big area for demonstrations. So I was tear gassed several times and water cannoned. Um, and there they put this orange stuff in the water, and it, it marks you for arrest, but also is a skin irritant. So the police are pretty uh, nasty over there. But it was really performance in the streets. Uh, and having performed uh, in the streets in the 70s against the war in Vietnam, et cetera, uh, I was kind of like charged. I mean, the performance aspect was also, it was alive. And there, the feelings there and the, the garbage burning and, and the canisters shooting back and forth and the students and, and demonstrators throwing the can canisters back. And then the entire neighborhood in these small streets uh, opening their windows and banging pots and pans so they would distract and make communication for the police very difficult. It was like spontaneous. Uh, and what activated them was, uh, in a sense, abstract. It's something going on in the air, a current, meaning the political situation, how it's becoming more fundamentalist Islamic as opposed to the secularist tradition in, in Turkey. So that's a big issue. And so these ideals, so in a sense, it's abstract. So these actions basically re refer to and activated an abstract, like a myth in a sense, you could say, or a story that's in the air and in everyone, but never spoken, yet highly pr uh, powerful and, and very performative uh, in many ways and very involving, very immersive. So, uh, you know, is that performance or what, where do we, draw the line, where do we call it a performance, or how do we validate that? There was, there was little text at all. A lot of visuals. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and that is our time. Thank you very much to our panelists. We can continue the conversation, but that's our time. So. Thanks. Thanks.